everybody, Dan Bailey here, and welcome to the 10th and final episode of my Fujifilm Retrospective, where I've been looking back at my 10-year journey shooting with the Fujifilm X-Series cameras. Before we get started, just want to say a couple quick things. I want to thank everybody who's tuned in and watched the other nine episodes of this series, and also commented. It's been great to read your comments and hear your own Fujifilm's tales and stories about your own X-Series life. And also thanks to my new Super Thanks fans. This is actually a brand new feature on my channel. You can look for the little heart-shaped icon below, and if you click that, you can give me a tip, you can leave me a comment. So just another way of helping support me in the channel. Certainly not required, but very much appreciated if you do take the effort. After all, it's the support of my awesome viewers who keep the channel running and keep all this fun happening here. And finally, I want to let you guys know about my Photography on the Brain video lesson series. This is my exclusive 30 lesson course where I dive down deeply into the realm of creativity and image making on a much more cerebral level than we usually do here on the YouTube channel. We explore a number of really cool concepts and techniques that are designed to challenge the way you think about shooting photos and can help you expand your own style as you're trying to become a more confident and well-rounded artist with the camera. And at the end of every lesson I give you an assignment that helps you figure out how to apply this to your own style and your own image making. So if you'd like to check out my Photography on the Brain lesson course, you can find that right here. Okay, let's get started with episode 10. It's been such an amazing trip to remember all this stuff and share some of my favorite photos that I've shot during the past decade. And of course, my Fujifilm life goes well beyond those 10 years. Between shooting Fuji slide film and using the X-Series cameras and seeing some of my photos printed on Fuji paper, I've been a Fuji user in some form or another for over 25 years, which is almost half my life. Now, it's been amazing to watch Fujifilm's own evolution during the past 10 years as well. And, and see how far mirrorless has come. You know, the technology was in its infancy when the X-Series was first launched over 10 years ago. By comparison, DSLR technology had a 10-year head start before mirrorless came along, and SLR technology had about a 35-year head start. Of course, Fujifilm wasn't starting from scratch with the X-Series. Before then, they had almost 80 years of history and a long legacy with film, cameras, lenses, and color science. And that included digital cameras as well. In fact, in 1995, the Nikon E-Series cameras was basically a system that was co-developed with Fujifilm. And after that, Fujifilm released a number of other DSLRs that were basically Nikon bodies that used Fujifilm's own software and electronics and proprietary software inside the cameras. And then they had the high-power super zooms that sort of fell in the middle between DSLRs and point-and-shoots. And these were called bridge cameras because they straddled that line between you know, consumer cameras and DSLRs. And these S-series cameras were actually great performing little machines with good optics and high resolution sensors. In fact, one of Fujifilm's reps, Jeff Hinzey, often uses these super zooms to shoot concert photos. He's an avid concert photographer and a rock and roll fan. And I gotta say, Jeff shoots some of the best, most amazing concert photos I've ever seen and I've been a rock and roll fan my whole life. And he's able to do this because, you know, you can't take a real camera inside a concert, but these little point and shoot style super zooms don't get much attention. But man, the photos he creates with those are absolutely stunning. And of course, one of the most notable innovations that Fuji's come along with are the film simulations. This first came about in 2003 inside the FinePix F700 camera. And inside this camera, you had a feature called FinePix Color which gave you three choices of looks. And these color profiles were based on Fuji's historical films, but they weren't exact film simulations yet. The next year in 2004, inside the S3 DSLR, this was the first time the film simulation name was used, and also the first time that exact films were modeled. And an interesting thing to note, the original X100 was called the FinePix X100, and it actually had an EXR sensor. The x sensor hadn't been developed yet. And the EXR sensor and processor was what they had been using when they had developed the original film simulation technology. And of course the rest is history. And now we've seen 43 different X-Series models between the X-A series cameras, the X-Q, the X-E series, the X-S, the X-T series, and the X-Pro. And as of right now, they have 35 lenses in the lineup, including 21 prime lenses, 10 zooms, and four XC lenses. And those are just the lenses that Fujifilm makes. And there's also a growing number of third-party lens options for the X-Series, including lenses made by LensBaby, 
Zeiss, Tokina, Rokinon, Tamron, Voigtlander, and you've got a number of Chinese-made lenses from smaller companies that include Viltrox, TT Artisans, Seven Artisans, and a lot of these lenses are actually really good. I've tried some of the Seven Artisans lenses, and they're really good quality. And of course, with the right adapter, you can use a huge amount of vintage lenses on your X-Series camera. I've seen people use everything from manual Nikon and Canon lenses to crazy old archaic German, Russian, Japanese lenses from the 60s and 70s and get excellent results. So after an exceptionally tough year in 2020, when pretty much the whole world was on lockdown and there were supply chain shortages and you know, we were all waiting to get vaccinated, Fujifilm kicked off 2021 with three brand new products, the XE4 and two new lenses, the revamped weather sealed version of the 27 millimeter pancake lens and the 70 to 300 zoom lens. With the XE4, Fujifilm brought the long awaited update to the stylish rangefinder series and gave it the same basic specs as the top of the line X-T4 minus the stabilization. It didn't have that, but it did have a new sensor, faster processor, faster autofocus system, the little AF joystick on the back, 4K shooting, the ultra fast electronic shutter, and two brand new film simulations. So basically the X-E4 brings full performance specs inside a smaller, more affordable body. It has the same 425 point autofocus system and performance as the X-T4, the X-T3, the X-100V, and the X-Pro3. And it has the classic neg film simulation and Eterna bleach bypass, neither of which the X-T3 have. And with its fast electronic shutter, that means you can use the pre-shot ES feature on the X-E4 to capture super fast action. And then there's the new updated 27 millimeter lens. The tiny little 27 has long been one of the sleepers in the line. It has very fast autofocus, ridiculously sharp glass, and it's itty bitty. The only thing it lacked was it didn't have an aperture ring and it wasn't weather sealed. But with the new updated version, both problems are fixed. It's weather sealed and it has a numbered working aperture ring. I've been using the 27 millimeter for years. I even had it for the Iceland trip right when the X-T1 was first announced. The fact that it's so small and such high quality lens and has a, an angle of view that's slightly wider than normal makes it a really useful lens for shooting a wide variety of subject matter. In fact, the 27 millimeter lens was my preferred lens for shooting aerials for a long time. And I'll still pull it out from time to time when I want to go extremely minimal. When you put this thing on one of your X-Series bodies, you have one incredibly compact little shooting machine that's almost the size of the X100. And obviously the new aperture ring makes it way easier to deal with changing settings when you're shooting in different exposure modes. With the original 27 that had no ring, there were different configurations between the two command dials and some other settings you had to do. And honestly, I could never remember what those steps were all the time. Even I had to look them up and I'm the guy who wrote that Fuji book. So yeah, the numbered aperture ring. And then there's the 70 to 300. This is one amazing lens but we're gonna save that one for later. So those are the three awesome pieces of gear that Fuji announced at the beginning of 2021. For me personally, 2021 kicked off with yet another award from the Adventure Junkies for having one of the top 25 outdoor photography blogs on the web. And this was the third time that I've received this award from them. It's such an honor for me to be included in this list of prominent outdoor photography websites. And of course it reaffirms that I might actually be doing something right. The Adventure Junkies site is a huge resource for tips and instruction and videos and advice on all kinds of outdoor pursuits. Their mindset that they put across is believe it, learn it, live it. And by utilizing this kind of thinking, you can pretty much achieve anything you want to do in life. If you believe that you can do it, you take the time and effort to learn whatever it is you want to do, and then you actually go out and practice it. And it definitely mirrors the approach and the message that I try to get across on my blog and also here on my YouTube channel. As I often do this time of year, I shot a lot of mountain aerials during the winter of 2021. At this time, I was still shooting with the X-T3, and there was one day in January when I decided to take along the 55-200 to lens. I don't usually shoot aerials with long telephoto lenses, but I do like the compressed look they give, and I like to shake things up and do different things from time to time. And of course, it's really cool to be able to zoom way in on these distant peaks. For this particular flight, my intention was to go land on one of the gravel bars or one of the frozen lakes out there and just go hike around and shoot some landscape photos, then go shoot aerials when the light got better. 
so I gave myself a couple hours to shoot in the front end before the light started. However, when I flew out there, the entire Kinnick Valley was socked in with clouds. So I just climbed up to about 7,000 feet and circled around for almost two hours shooting landscapes and shooting distant scenes with these mountains, the 55 to 200. And I spent a lot of time shooting with the Acros film simulation and playing around with those warm and cool black and white tones, which is a lot of fun. I really enjoy using this to vary the looks of my imagery. And then after a couple hours, the magic started to happen. And the lights started getting really good. So I switched to Velvia and just started snapping frame after frame as I made these wide circles around the peaks, capturing these snow fields and crevasse fields and these rocky ridges, just watching this beautiful magical pink light get stronger and stronger until it finally crescendoed with the most brilliant colors and then began to fade. It's almost like visual overload out there right at the end. And I often liken it to a symphony out there, like a symphony of light where you begin and you have these soft themes that start reoccurring and they get more dramatic and louder and much brighter. And then it starts to build and build with intensity and you have this massive crescendo and this huge finale and then it's all over. So when the finale ended on this particular symphony, I closed the window, warmed my hands up a little bit, drank some hot chocolate, ate some cookies and flew back to Anchorage satisfied with another amazing episode of winter aerial photography in Alaska. And then at the end of March, after waiting over a year, I finally got the X-T4 in my hands. I finally had the chance to try using a stabilized sensor to shoot these aerials and shoot aerial video as well. And I got the chance to try out the new film simulation, Eterna Bleach Bypass. I actually did a full review of Eterna Bleach Bypass, which you can watch here. But basically, Eterna Bleach Bypass film simulation gives you a very low saturation color look, but with very high tonality. In my mind, it's best described as color that's almost monochrome. And that's actually very close to the way Fujifilm describes it as well. It's a really interesting look. Now, oftentimes when you pull the color all the way back, an image can end up looking really bland. But by boosting the tonality of the image, by retaining those rich, bold blacks and shadows, you add that drama back. And so it's a really cool look to have high contrast but low saturation. And of course, anytime you pull a certain element back in photography, you invite the viewers to imagine what it is that's missing. And inherently that creates a stronger image for your viewer because they're using their own brains even more to process what's going on and what they're looking at. I especially like to boost the shadow tone when I'm using Eternal Bleach Bypass, especially when I'm shooting landscapes. This gives it a look that's kind of like Velvia, but again, with the color pulled all the way back. It's a really cool look. I also occupied myself quite a bit that winter by riding my fat bike and working on some brand new songs that I started recording at the beginning of the year. By April, I had four new songs finished, plus the Dr. Fauci song from the previous year, and I had the audio track for my aerial adventure video. And at the end of April, I mixed all the songs down and I released them as a full album, which I called Up Higher, featuring eight songs total, some instrumental, some vocal. The Up Higher album was the most personal and the most ambitious music project I'd ever created. So basically being influenced by the events of the previous year, I had decided to dedicate myself to spending more time doing music, which has been a very important part of my life. The album title was chosen to reflect the personal feelings that I tried to convey in some of the songs. And the album cover photo was an image that I shot with the 55 to 200 and the X-T4 during one of my aerial photography flights over the Chugach Mountains. You can find me and listen to the album on any of your favorite music streaming sites. It's on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, Amazon Music, Pandora, YouTube Music, all the others. If you do listen, I'd love to hear what you think. Anyway, I'd been scrambling to get the album done by the end of April because I knew that May was coming. And when May finally hit, it was like summer arrived. The weather was gorgeous. And of course that meant it was time to get away from my desk and go do stuff outside. I spent the spring of 2021 outside hiking or flying my little plane, shooting all kinds of stuff with the X-T4. One time I went out and did a bunch of bird photography with the X-T4 and the 55 to 200. You wouldn't normally think of the 55 to 200 as a BIF lens, but with good technique, you can get it done. And by May, I was fully vaccinated. So I started doing stuff with friends again, going to the brewery, doing bike events, doing stuff without masks on. And when June hit, I started mountain bike racing again. In June, I shot an enduro mountain bike race here in Anchorage with the X-T4 and the 100-400 lens. 
it's amazing how capable that lens is for shooting action. In fact, I shot a whole bunch of video as well during the race with surprisingly good results. I was so impressed with some of the footage I shot, some of which had been shot in high speed mode, which is essentially makes slow motion video. After it was done, I came home, threw a bunch of clips together and made a short adventure movie, which you can watch right here. And then in July, I got this bad boy, a 70 to 300. As I said, this is one amazing lens. At 799, it's way cheaper than the 100 to 400, but it gets you into that long telephoto range in a lens form factor that's not all that big and heavy. In terms of size and weight, it's very close to the 55 to 200, but there's a few features that make it quite a bit more versatile. For one thing, it's weather sealed. It has a highly improved image stabilization system. It has a much closer focus capabilities, and it works with the 1.4X and the 2X teleconverters. In fact, I've got the 1.4X teleconverter on there right now. Doesn't add very much, does it? Take it off, look at that. When you put the teleconverter on, you increase the magnification ratio of the lens. That means you can get closer to your subject and fill the frame even more with stuff that you're shooting close up. Imagine shooting distant wildlife and pulling it even closer, or shooting mountains and stacking those ridges, or shooting really dramatic sunsets or the moon and getting an even larger big orb of light in your frame. And of course, with the improved stabilization, which gives you five and a half stops, you can shoot this thing ridiculously low shutter speeds, even handheld. This thing is super capable and it's pretty small. In fact, one of the first things I did with it was throw it in my little camera pack and do an all day cross country mountain bike ride with it. As I said, the beginning of the summer started great. A lot of bike riding, a lot of photography, a lot of really fun stuff hanging out with friends. Well, by July, things had started to take a turn. By July, COVID resurged with the Delta variant. So we all started putting our masks back on and retreating into our bubbles again. And in the second week of July, I injured my shoulder mountain biking. I basically strained the bicep tendon in my right arm. And being the biggest tendon in your upper body, it hurt a lot. Really reduced my mobility and my strength. But fortunately, it didn't keep me off my bike too much. Uh, I did rest it for a while, but I taped it up every week and I kept mountain bike racing. And I actually won first place for masters by the end of the season. And at the beginning of August, I did a 100 mile mountain bike race in under 12 hours. So after all the racing was done for the season, I got off the bike, I started to rest more, try to recover, and I spent a lot of time in my garden shooting close-ups with the 70 to 300. And oftentimes I would use the teleconverter and the little MCEX11 extension tube. So with those two stacked on there, your magnification ratio increases even more. And you can get some really dramatic close-ups. So I actually did a lot of that kind of photography throughout the rest of the summer and I had a ton of fun. Then in September, I got a pair of the Fujifilm EF20 flashes and the EFW1 Wireless Commander. I've done a lot of flash photography in the past, but in the past few years, I hadn't done very much with the Fujis, uh, in part because I was just doing different things, but also because the flash gear hadn't quite caught up to the whole mirrorless revolution. But by now, the flash gear had evolved to be completely compatible with mirrorless cameras. So I dove in with total enthusiasm and started shooting a lot of flash that fall. I was trying new techniques. I was testing out the capabilities of the wireless commander and the two Fuji flashes. I actually shot some amazing flash photos in my garden. So some of those same flowers I'd been shooting, you know, a few weeks earlier. With the flash, I was able to add a whole new dimension and create some very dramatic photos. I also shot a whole season of cyclocross racing with the flashes. And in fact, this was my 10th year of shooting cyclocross. So I was kind of celebrating that as well. And in some ways I'd come full circle because some of my favorite cross images from the past had been shot with my Nikon flashes and the Photoflex strobe lights I was using. So this was like coming full circle with similar gear, but much lighter weight equipment and trying new techniques and expanding on kind of picking up where I left off all those years ago. And I'd gotten such good results over the past month or so that I decided to revamp my flash book. And so in October, I did a huge edit and released a second edition to my ebook, Going Fast with Light, which you can find here. Also in October, I celebrated my 25 year mark for being a full-time pro photographer. This was a huge milestone for me. And when I think back to all the events and assignments and photo sales and places that I've traveled and people that I've met and everything that's happened in the past two and a half decades, it just blows me away to think that I've made it this far. 
And of course, Fujifilm has been a vital part of that journey for almost every single one of those 25 years. After an awesome winter, an incredible spring, and a great beginning to summer, fall kind of ended in a whimper for me. With my shoulder still nagging, I finally went to see a doctor. Turns out it was Keegan Randall's doctor as well, so I felt in good hands. In addition to the strained bicep, I had a classic case of frozen shoulder. So he basically put me on a track of three straight months of physical therapy, which took me all through the end of the year. So I didn't do much for the late fall of 2021. Took a lot of long walks, sometimes with the camera, sometimes without. When the snow and cold finally came in November, I had fun shooting Horfrost with the 70 to 300. And I also dove back into music. I took many trips to Guitar Center and began my shoulder PT buying binge which lasted well into the winter time. I bought like seven new guitar pedals, a brand new keyboard, a couple synthesizers, but it all came into good use because I started doing a brand new series of making short videos that I set to original music that I would write and record. These were basically 30 to 60 second mini film scores that I set to my own videos, uh, many of that were shot with my Fuji cameras. They were really fun and I ended up posting a lot of them on Instagram as Instagram Reels. I posted 14 of these videos in the last five weeks of the year, and in total I did 30 by the end of the winter. So I finished 2021 with my last physical therapy session, I got full mobility back, and at the very end of 2021, I shot the first episode of my brand new series called And that brings us to the end of 2021, which officially concludes the first 10 years of my Fujifilm X-Series life. And what a truly amazing 10 years it's been so far. And I want to thank you guys so much for watching this series and joining me as I recount my adventures in the last decade, uh, many of which you have been around to see. I know that many of you guys have indeed been following me for longer than 10 years. And so for that, I thank you for your support. I'm looking forward to what the rest of 2022 brings. So far, it's starting off pretty good. And I'm certainly looking forward to the next decade and seeing what that brings as well. Right now, I'm 54 years old. I feel like I'm at the prime of my life. I feel like I'm stronger than ever. And I'm having as much fun with creativity and photography and music as I ever have in my whole life. So again, thank you very much for watching this series. Please leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. Share any other X-Series stories you haven't told me so far. And if you are a Fuji shooter, you'll definitely want to check out my best-selling ebook, X-Series Unlimited. This 400-page guidebook will show you everything you need to know in order to have the most fun and get the best results from your Fuji camera. Please subscribe to my channel. You can leave me a super thanks if you want. You can find me on social media and Patreon at Dan Bailey Photo. And you can check out my Instagram music channel at Dan Bailey Music. And you can visit my website and blog as well. Thanks very much for your support. Have fun with your cameras out there. Have a great summer and I'll see you for the next video.